hear a um a short live message. streaming is on exactly so um so welcome everybody to the berlin stoics and the first part of two parts on marcus aurelius um we have never done a meetup on him never um this is maybe a quite surprising fact for a stoic meetup um um We've done some on, Mark, uh, on Epictetus, on Seneca, on uh, lesser known uh, philosophical or stoic figures. Um, uh, <laughs> um, and many, many, many intersecting topics or broader applicable topics like stoicism and the family. Uh, we've done stoicism and Buddhism, stoicism and Epicureanism. Um, so we've covered a broad range of topics, um, but never on Marcus Aurelius. And I think this is a good kind of culmination in that because um, of uh, eight months or nine months or so, um, and this is the, the month of his date of birth or supposed date of birth, and this is a good time that we finally reached a point where we can really talk about Marcus Aurelius, um, at least for those who've been here in the past or, the, or who know a little bit about Stoicism in context, and for those who are new, um, uh, Marcus Aurelius is always a great introduction to Stoicism. If you don't know much about it, I think his read is really, really um, applicable um, to to your life, and it really um, able you're able to connect it well and, and apply it to your daily experiences. Um, just as a note, before we really get into the deep nitty gritty stuff, the translation that you use. Um, I know there's about four or five translations, maybe more. Uh, for example, I have um, I have a uh, 2006 pub uh, published translation um, uh, in tech in, in hard copy with me. Um, there are four free translations on the wiki source link. Um, if you have another hard copy with you, so every time you quote Marcus Aurelius um, from his meditations, if you want to use some of this text uh, for this discussion, please post in the chat, which translation you're using. Maybe just helpful for us to, to know which one it is, because if we're all looking at our own copies and wondering that's not the one that I'm seeing, um, it may be just helpful for us to know that it's a different translation where if you're interested, the translation you're using, it would be good to look it up. Um, I have no structure in terms of which part today and next Saturday we focus on which part of Marcus Aurelius, or if this is a repetitive nature, um, a nature kind of two-part series where we repeat next Saturday what we discuss today with new participants, um, or we kind of move uh, move away from that and maybe delve deeper next week into a second part um, on his meditations or how it connects broadly to Stoicism. Um, but today, I would like to focus more on Marcus Aurelius and his meditation specifically, um, and then maybe from there extract broader Stoic, Stoic um, principles and Stoic philosophies, um, especially for those who are just introducing themselves to the philosophy. I think that makes a lot more sense in context when you read his meditations. You obviously know what he's talking about, and then you can extract that to broader principles. Um, so what I'd like to ask, um, is we don't have to go around in the room in rotation, um, but if somebody would like to start, here's my first question for everybody. Um, is there a passage in the meditations that you would like to begin with, a, a passage that for you personally really spoke to you um, and that uh, either really connected to your life or really connected to you in a way that could help you um, in your life? or help you grow in your life. I think that's a good way to begin. Yanis. Um, I thought maybe a good idea is to start with a, with a, a part of the text um, that for me connects quite well with the pandemic. Um, because everybody keeps saying the sentence or the phrase, when we go back to normal. And um, I, I like this, this uh, part in the text. It is, I think, the chapter uh, Delta or D, I don't know how, or four, and paragraph 36, um, that says, nature loves nothing better than changing, and everything is changing without never coming back. Um, and so 
I think it's important to realize that the change is a good thing and, and we will never go back to normal when it comes to the pandemic or when it comes to anything. Um, and everything that happens is the beginning of, of something new. So, so I, th I, think, I think this is try something I try to, to remember every day. Thank you. Um, thank you for, for, for introducing that quote as the first one. Um, I was reading in the introduction to my book, um, and that's the whole part four, you're right, is about um, change. Um, he quotes Epictetus, he quotes um, uh, other philosophers and his, um, uh, and his people in his life. But one that he doesn't, I don't think mentions explicitly, but one that he mentions uh, in the introduction to this book, the editor notes that um, uh, that Marcus was deeply influenced in by Heraclitus, um, the pre-Socratic philosopher, um, who developed the ideas of this notion of flux, that everything is in flux, that you never put your foot in the same river twice. Um, and that kind of idea, I think, really, really um, trickled down into his philosophy. Um, he, they, they, did, they do mention that he was deeply influenced by him. Um, and that connection to nature, I know, is definitely an Epictetus thing. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, Shakam. Yeah, I really like uh, this one. Hasten to examine uh, thy own ruling uh, faculty. I'm, I'm using, I um, think, start of the 20th century uh, translation. That's that's why it's a bit uh, archaic language. And I think um, this is one of the more most central uh, pillars of uh, any philosophy, the self-examination, self-reflection, because without knowing uh, how you think, um, you can't improve yourself. You you can't um, you can't learn anything new. And the examining of uh, oneself, the surrounding, and and the universe, I think, is a one of the most uh, important parts. Yeah. Can you just mention again? I forget, I forget if you said it, or can you write it down that the book and the in the chapter? Oh, it's from book section? nine. Yeah. Oh, nine. Okay. Yeah, I'm using the Kindle, uh, so it gives me a location, but not. Um, hmm. yeah. Okay. Does everybody see the quote, by the way? It's in, in the chat, in the chat, if you got the notification. I see it, but the translation is for me very difficult. Yeah. yeah. yeah I'm sorry. <laughs> hasten, hasten to examine. That's when you know you're not in the 21st century anymore. Um, hasten to examine thy own ruling faculty and that of the universe and that of thy neighbor. Um, he's, he's really asking yourself to try to understand um, uh, Try to not generally try to use your reason, which is, which is a stoic thing, but um, try to use your reason to examine others um, before you basically take any action. Um, that's what I would understand it as. In context, anyway, he doesn't talk about action in this quote, um, but this is a big stoic principle um, uh, um, uh, to, to think before you act. Um, there is a in book in book one he mentions as he's talking about um, or as he's giving an homage to each of the people in his life for having given um, uh, this kind of characteristic or that kind of characteristic to him um, to him as a kind of influence on his life and what he wants to take with him in his life. Um, he then goes on to um, uh, basically the last passage in book one 
in book one, chapter 17, they call them chapters, but the, the paragraph 17, um, he, he says from the gods, he says, or to the gods um, for what, has, what, he, what they have given to him. Um, and in, in this section, he talks about um, uh, in the last um, uh, page, um, it is it this one or is it the next one? There's a couple of sections when he discusses the gods. So, um, it's in, um, sorry. Yeah, so when you finish, I, I, I can say. Yeah, um, in book one, chapter 17, and I don't know if these are the same numbers, but he, uh, this one numbers it, book 117, six. So they also cut it up into different um, subparagraphs, six. Um, that I acquired a clear and constant picture of what is meant by the life according to nature. So that with regard to the gods, their communications from that world, their help and their inspiration, nothing now prevents me living the life of nature. Um, my falling somewhat short still is due to my own fault and my failure to observe the promptings, not to say the instructions of the gods. Um, he does this repeatedly. He actually does this in book two, then book three. He, he continues to talk about, um, he says this differently whether it's in this case is Shakam uh, quoted um, uh, following the logic or logos of the universe. In this case, he talks about following the instructions of the gods or following what nature provides him. Um, and he does this often when he says he, he, he needs to, and this is my own fault if I don't do it, follow what nature tells me I should be doing. I think Whenever he discusses, um, this is something I find a bit ambiguous, but I think in the Stoic literature and the Stoic philosophy, what we found is that whenever um, Marcus Aurelius or um, others talk about nature, the gods, or the universe, they're pretty much saying something quite similar. What they're talking about is following logos, following this um, this ability to reason and um, uh, um, rationally understand what's going on around you so you can then follow that um, and accept that what's happening to you is what's happening to you um, before you act, before you make a decision. Um, uh, this is something to prevent um, uh, false expectations. Um, this is also something to prevent um, false action um, that may be based on judgments or impressions that may not really truly represent what's going on. Yanis, you wanted to mention another quote? Um, no, no, I just um, uh, want to point out that in this paragraph, I think everything connects to, to, the, to the virtue of justice. This is what uh, I understand what it says, um, um, even though the translation is uh, strange, but it says, um, um, the, the the to make it just um and 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 i agree completely with you that this connects to action yeah when a justice is act, how we act um in the um in in as part of a universe or uh, as part of of um of a bigger thing so at the end um whatever we do has to be for the, for the good of the call um, and therefore uh, it would be just and good for us at the end. So I think more. That's really nice that you pointed it out. Just before, just before I, 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 I swivel over to Shikham, um, our past two meetups were on, um, we we're really focusing on this virtue of justice because we were focusing on service to the community and cosmopolitanism and um, this idea that the Stoics, yeah, you're right, they, they understood us being as part of the cosmos um, in order to try 
and be more cosmopolitan to understand we're really no different from other people or that um, instead of talking about each other as different, rather talk about each other as, though we may be different, talk about each other as both underneath this cosmos, both both all citizens of this cosmos or of the world or of humanity. Um, uh, and you're right, this is a real connection to the virtue of justice, which I think is a bad translation. I've seen, I know I've seen other translations of that virtue, um, but when we think of justice, we think of a consequence. We think of, I think we think of um, uh, somebody does something wrong, and so you have to impose justice on them in order to um, ensure that nobody else does anything afterwards. But um, it, I think it's, it's quite reversed in Stoicism. Justice is a virtue that you do um, before any consequence. It's what you do in service to others, um, which is, a, I, I think, a, maybe it's not so such a bad translation when you redefine that term because it's perhaps a more compassionate virtue than, than the typical justice we think of in our society. Um, Shaka. Yeah, um, thanks uh, for that. Um, I don't really th uh, think it's um, related uh, to uh, justice, but yeah, if we if we say that something is just if it's um, in line with the universe, with logic, um, whatever uh, the you know the guiding principles of uh, the universe uh, might be, um, then it's it's just. And then, I agree. It's a, it's a, it's, an, it's a good um, observation. I always thought it's um, it's about wisdom. And uh, using wisdom, and uh, the the self, the ex examining of the self of the others of the universe, in order to gain. This, uh, this wisdom and uh, understanding and trying to act uh, accordingly and not, not to be a stranger to the universe. Thank you for that. Um, it's, I just want to make a, an interesting comment. It's quite interesting that all of our quotes for now are um, quite about this idea of a connection to the universe. Um, the, the, the quotes that um, Shikam and, and Giannis have pointed out. I'm not sure if that, though, has something to do with more about the translation that they're, they're using, or the idea that the, um, the universe might be kind of an equivalent term for the cosmos, the world, the, the, or nature. I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if this is also a translation problem, where sometimes the universe is somewhat equivalent. Um, I remember we had looked up, uh, we had quickly looked up a, because uh, this was part of a discussion on the passions, and I think we were looking up at uh, the stoic root or the Greek root for the word good or evil, or, um, uh, and we ended up finding out that they, that the translations, or at least the, the meanings that the Greeks had had, really refer to each other. They're kind of self-referential. So I'm not sure if they had a, also a an really good analytical detailed picture of some of these some of these technical terms, um, because I don't think they they really focused on the technicality. Um, just a general comment. I thought I thought it was interesting that we're all um, we're all we all thought, or at least a couple of us, have really focused on these quotes that um, ask us to connect ourselves to the universe um, and to understand um, uh, how to how to connect to others or how. To to, I think Giannis's first quote is very different about this connection to the the universe and understand that everything has changed. That there really is no um, uh, that what what will come now will eventually will pass in the next moment. Um, and so, but I thought this is an interesting trend seeing throughout the quotes. Um, does anybody else have a quote that particularly either spoke to them or they think is most reflective of how they think they should be able to use the meditations to grow, um, to grow for Marcus Aurelius' uh, meditations? Tony. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, I'll just put the quote in the 
the text box if that's okay. It's one of Marcus Aurelius's more well-known quotes. Um, but really, Stoicism, for me, on a personal level, is about the practical elements and how we apply it to our everyday lives and how we can improve our situations generally. And this quote to me, in fact, it was in the article that um, a medium.com I discovered Stoicism through and really genuinely spoke to me. Um, I think it's highlighting the, um, the difference between objectivity and subjectivity and the relative uselessness of our own feelings in certain situations. Um, so that quote really spoke to me. It, it, it sort of made me feel that, you know, you can be um, in control of your own emotion in a way and turn that energy around and use it in a positive way objectively. Um, although it's one of his well-known quotes um, from the outset that pricked my interest in Stoicism. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a, and I'm, I'm trying to find it because I haven't written down um, everything that I passed by, but there is a, there is a section um, because it's not the beginning of a passage, I can't find it. Um, but I think it's at the end of a passage, at the end of a, a chapter that he he says, um, uh, I think it's everything is, everything derives from the mind or whatever you think you can make, or he, he, he connects the, he, he tries to make an argument uh, very quickly as he usually does in these compact chapters that whatever you think you can do, you can do, or whatever you, um, I guess philosophically, this would be a type of idealism that you can really make ideally what you have in your mind or reality as long as you put it forward. Um, and I think this, this definitely is a good example of that, where if this is a very stoic thing to do. I mean, I'm also generally recalling some of these general principles for anybody else new here, anybody else getting into stoicism just as the beginning, that um, uh, um, the stoics have this idea of a dichotomy of control. That there are some things you can control and some things you can't control. Um, these internal things and these external things, very broadly speaking. So the internal things you can control, the external things you can't control. So um, imagine, um, it, this is also comes up in Marcus Aurelius's text, but um, uh, this is a good example of, of Tony's quote he pulled out. Um, the pain is not due to the thing itself, but to your estimate of it. So imagine somebody dying in your life, which Mark, happens to Marcus Aurelius over and over again. Um, then of course the person dying is something you can't control. It's external to you, it just happened. What you can control is your feelings, your emotions about it. You're dealing your reaction to it. Um, and so that's a very stoic thing to do, that to accept what is beyond your control and to understand that what is within your control, you should, you should go ahead and try to do everything in your power to control it because that's just what is in your control. Um, yeah, this, this speaks very broadly to a Stoic doctrine, not just Marcus Aurelius, um, but he does have a nice way of putting it. What, uh, which translation is this, Tony? This is from Oxford University Press. It's Christopher Gill, 2013. Oh, oh it's a Gill, it's the Gill version, okay. Yeah. For those of you interested, um, it's a uh, Christopher Gill edition. Christopher Gill is part of the modern Stoicism movement. Um, he, he's quite uh, popular in the modern Stoic field today. He's part of the modern Stoic organization. Um, so if you're interested, that's a really good edition. I wanted to pull out my own quote that I thought was um, something that really spoke to me, something I'm, I'm, I'm pulling from book one. I've only read the first four books, but I'm really pulling from book one the past, with the, just the past few 10 minutes, because I, I really thought it was probably unlike anything else in philosophy, um, because every paragraph was like a succinct sec, sec, uh, uh, 
a capture of characteristics and principles that I wanted to embody myself. Um, every time he mentioned, um, uh, I think there are some exceptions. I don't think he's perfect. So for example, um, as a kind of an anti-example, um, he says in book 116, from my adopted father, and he goes on, um, he says his adopted father being Antoninus Pius, the, the previous emperor. And he says what he's learned from him, blah, blah, blah. And he says, how to putting a stop to homosexual love. There are some things in this text I think we can understand that in context back then um, as an emperor in the, um, uh, I forget if it was the second or third century, um, he, um, that's something you have to understand that um, this is not a end all be all kind of book, um, but this is really a, a good summary of everything that I would like to embody. The, the best one I could find is actually the one right before. This is why I'm looking at it in 15, book 115. Um, and I'll put the, the edition here just as, just as I read the quote. Um, I'm sorry, this is a hard copy. I can, um, I can write it after, after I speak it. Um, he says, from Maximus, self-mastery immune to any passing whim, good cheer in all circumstances, including illness, a nice balance of character, both gentle and dignified, an uncomplaining energy for what needs to be done. Um, just the beginning is really, really like that's it's 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 a very different kind of understanding of self discipline. Whenever I think of self discipline, um, or people think of being productive, um, they think of hard, brutal work that makes you sweat, that you have to, um, uh, um, or that. Um, uh, is exhausting and irritating, but needs to be done. Um, but he kind of paints Maximus as this person who does what needs to be done without complaining, um, without even considering its difficulty. Even if it's difficult, it's just something that needs to be done. So just do it. Um, there was actually another uh, um, uh, Berlin Stoic participant maybe two or three months ago who said that one of the a slogan he uses in his day-to-day life is just do it. Um, something as simple as that, um, that he uses to remind himself and meditate whenever he needs to get something done. Um, the trust he inspired in everyone that he meant what he said and was well-intentioned in all that he did, proof against surprise or panic, and nothing either hurried or hesitant, um, never short of resource, never downcast or cringing, or on the other hand, angry or suspicious, generosity and good works and a forgiving and truthful nature. And the next section, I think, the next two sections, I think, were, were my favorite. He ended with the impression he gave undeviating rectitude as a path chosen rather than enforced. The fact that no one would ever have thought himself belittled by him, but presumed to consider himself superior to him. That's just a, a perfect person, like somebody who never um, treats you as inferior, never treats you as superior. Um, they treat their fellow person, their fellow friend, their fellow stranger as somebody who is um, uh, just another person. Um, and that the idea of undeviating rectitude, the idea that they, he, he, he young complains on what needs to be done when he has to do it. Um, and he, um, uh, um, he each, the, a, as a path chosen, rather than enforced. He knows what he wants to do. Um, he chooses it rationally. That's, I think, what we get from this passage. If you want to connect it back to the first couple of quotes, um, a couple of others mentioned here is that um, he, he, he makes a mention of this guy, Maximus, who I, I looked in the notes, is not really well known in history, um, that he does things rationally um, rather than just doing something because he feels forced to do it. I think this is a really good passage about, um, sure, sure, I think wisdom and the other virtues are in here, but I think this is a really good passage about um, uh, self-discipline or temperance and a little bit of justice. If you also consider the, the characteristics about the trust he inspired in everyone, um, how he never belittled anyone or anybody thought belittled by him. This is a good, um, I really like this first opening, the opening of this, of this book just, makes you want to be these people, makes you want to have these characters. And then that's what draws you into the book because you're like, wow, I got to find out how to actually be these people. 
So this was just, a, for me, the perfect opening. I'll, I'll write the addition down here. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's really nice that uh, he starts um, his journal uh, by just being just uh, just gratitude to all the, the people that uh, help him um, grow up and to the person that uh, he is when writing the, the book. Um, and then uh, the, also he like remembers all these people, some of them are like, uh, you know, teachers, like private teachers that uh, uh, he, uh, he had, um, like the one that taught him a uh, grammar and, and, and such. So it's not just, uh, you know, sages and great philosophers, but uh, all the people that uh, helped him uh, along the way. It's uh, nothing to be, I don't know, admirable. Yeah. There's also, um, yeah, you're right, there's, there are people unknown and people known in, in that first book he mentions. And um, it's actually a nice, interesting note. In this edition, this is a, um, uh, the publisher. So that was the the um, the person. Martin Hammond is the one who um, translated this. Um, but Penguin, the Penguin Classic series, is the is the publisher of, of this book. Um, and they have notes in the back. And and what's interesting, there's a particular person he actually mentions connects well to the Stoics' treatment of others. Um, and they're they're kind of sustained, um, sustained, non, I guess non passion towards others. That is, when when a stoic mentions a passion, they mean uh, an unwanted emotion, something that is um, too much for you to really have. That really um, dismantles your rationality, dismantles your reason. Um, uh, so I think this this connection to one of these people he has um, really speaks to that. Uh, how uh, this virtue of justice, how he treats others. And it's it's the uh, a person named Fronto in book 111. So a little bit before the quote I mentioned before. And he speaks very, very shortly about him. Um, but apparently Fronto was his best friend. Um, in the notes that I read, Fronto was his best friend, but the, they had kind of split up. Fronto was a tutor and his best friend, but they split up uh, a little bit philosophically uh, Marcus uh, Fronto wanted him to become a, a, a I, I guess this was a big deal for them academically. Uh, Fronto was a rhetorician. Um, he uh, was um, a tutor in rhetoric. He was a sophist. And um, Marcus Aurelius turned to Stoicism. And this is a real deviation between them. And um, uh, they, but they continued to stay in contact. They had some hostility toward each other, I guess, in um, philosophical views. Um, but um, uh, this, which is why his, um, his remark to him is so short and brief. So he doesn't really say too much about him. Um, but it, it, they do mention that they had found a group of letters of correspondence between these two characters. Um, and they talk about how in these notes in the back of the book, um, their long, long, long lasting friendship until death, um, that he, he never gave up on him. They always, they stayed in contact, which I thought was um, endearing. So the question is still open. Um, I can continue drawing quotes from here and discussing a certain stoic principles that we draw from some of these quotes. There are more. Um, even Tony's quote has a lot to unpack from it. I think we can go deeper into. Um, we can go chronologically into the book. But I would also like to ask if anybody else had peered into the meditations, if there's anything else you draw from it that you want to speak about. Yeah. 
Yeah, Marcus. Well, um, I just want to point out one quote. Well, it's, it's not really, I uh, would, would put it differently, but one, put that, uh, one quote that resonated with me. And I ha don't remember if it uh, had been mentioned in the past. It's, it's a bit misanthropic, but um, um, I posted um, this, this quote. Wait, can everybody hear me? It's, it's a bit weird. Um, well, the, the object in life is not to be on the side of the majority, but to escape finding oneself in the ranks of the insane. It's a bit, I would put it a bit differently um, that the object in life is uh, to become focused uh, on something and not to get lost in the majority and don't, to not get pulled in directions in which you don't want to go. And that this kind of resonated with me um, because I'm very much uh, focused on planning my life a bit uh, more and, uh, and not to become too much lost in dopamine rushes and caring too much about others. Yeah, well, that's basically it. Was there more of a context to this quote? I don't remember reading this. Yeah, can can you point to the chapter or? To be yeah, honest, can I you read it? Ah, oh, okay, okay. Oh, okay. Um, but um, this makes a lot of sense um, for for Marcus. He um, uh, in the short summary of his life, I was reading. He um, uh, he never was such a, a boy when in his youth. There were some um, they, they, they discuss in his times that I mean, people as young as him would go out to the games. They would go out to the chariot races or the games like that, and they would be, be fans of the sport. They would root for their team. They root for the color. And Marcus kind of disdained at that. He just liked reading books and um, being tutor. Um, he was a, I guess back then. Um, was I guess in context for his time a geek. Um, he he really liked doing philosophy, um, and um, uh, apparently he likes, for example, he likes sleeping on the floor, like in the how he how he called it, how the Greeks trained in philosophy. He liked sleeping on the floor. He liked living with few with few material needs. Um, something I think that apparently his mother had to talk him out of doing. Um, and I think this definitely speaks to his character, um, not to be on the side of the majority, or at least the object of life is not to be on the side of the majority. Like, just don't go with whatever else that anybody tells you. Um, don't take for granted that what everybody else tells you. Um, uh, but to escape finding oneself in the ranks of the insane. Um, this is quite ironic, the fact that he tells you to go in the direction of the insane, because perhaps the, the idea is that perhaps the insane, if they're the opposite of the majority, they are out there, if they're not really the normal, then perhaps they have something else to say um, other than what the majority is saying. Um, at least this is the way I'm reading this quote. I don't know if I'm interpreting it differently, but he's, that's what he's saying, is that the object of life is not to be on the side of the majority, but to escape finding oneself in the ranks of the insane. Um, he didn't like to, he didn't mind being different. Um, or to think differently than others. Um, I think I saw Shakam's hand up and then uh, Melis and then Morton. Uh, so Shakam? Uh, yeah, um, about um, being humble uh, and sleeping uh, like a legionnaire in, in the camp instead of a uh, um, son to a noble family destined uh, to, be, to be the, the emperor. Uh, he didn't like to wear the royal purple, so he went um, in civilian clothing to uh, hear lectures uh, and stuff, and people at the court really didn't like it. But he's trying to be more of, of a philosopher than an emperor. 
and <laughs> yeah, it's a good uh, role model. Reminds me a bit of uh, the um, uh, the the poor president. I can't. Is it uh, Chile or, or Peru? The president that um, drives uh, like a very old car and still lives uh, in like a small uh, uh, country house. I can't remember which uh, uh, South American president uh, it is, but like very humble, very reserved. And yeah, that's, you know, the ruling uh, old leaders should be also role models. And most leaders are not really. Um, Melis. Yeah, maybe I'm um, the last passage Mark would send uh, re uh, resonates something uh, about my life. That's why I'm trying to understand more. Uh, maybe I'm uh, I'm losing in uh, translation, but uh, from the concept of majority, uh, as far as I understand about popularity or being loved by a group of people, not about minimalism, as far as I understand, but uh, you you look from another perspective, uh, Steve. So I'm I would like to try understand this more. You are right, though. Like he does. Um, maybe that was a um, my example of him sleeping on the floor. It wasn't so much about. I wasn't trying to point out necessarily his minimalism. I was trying to point out the fact that he. You're right. He doesn't care about who likes him or if how popular he is. Um, he cares more about if he does the right thing. He doesn't care that that goes against the majority. Um, so I think you're right. I think that has more about the principle um, about fame and popularity than it does about minimalism. Um, though there is a minimalist kind of kind of message in Stoicism to an extent, especially for the ascetic so Stoics. I think you can call them ascetics. I think back then, um, especially the Greek Stoics were very ascetic. The Cynics and the Stoics and the Epicureans. They were a little bit like Eastern ascetics to an extent, and not their philosophy, but their way of life um, and how they live very minimally and differently and out in the streets as opposed to others. Um, but their principle of non, not really um, your target as fame, fortune, or popularity is definitely what he's talking about here, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, something I think often he, he mentions over and over again, too. Um, he. What I find interesting is that he never really mentions anything about his being emperor. He mentions about his um, sometimes being out uh, in battle, or maybe he mentions about his family, but he never mentions about his responsibilities as emperor. Um, I think he never really liked to talk about it. I think, I'm not sure if I would say he didn't like being emperor. Maybe he did, I can't speak to his, his opinion. Um, uh, maybe he thought that him being emperor was better than his grandfather Hadrian being emperor, you know, maybe he maybe he thought in that term in that way, but um, he definitely didn't like shouting to the uh, to the to the audience that he was this cool emperor, or, or he obviously didn't care what people thought of his philosophy because he didn't ever meant for this to be published. Um, yeah, it's it's also a bit endearing that he would do that. Um, it's humble. I think, yeah, endearing is not the word. Endearing, I, I, in the terms of, in the sense that I really like him and I really like the way he 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 strives for that kind of nobility and virtue. But um, uh, yeah, um, Morton. Yeah. So one of the quotes that really stood out to me, uh, partially because it spoke to me uh, personally, it's from. Uh, book one, chapter 17, when he's thanking the different people and he says, uh, from the gods, and there's a long section, and then he says, that I preserved the flower of my youth and did not play the man before my time, but even delayed a little, little longer. Um, yeah, this was from the Far Course on translation from 1940 or something like that, I think. Uh, this to me was interesting because I think it's in contrast to what he's talking about. Most of the time he's kind of talking about this duty, uh, do your work. Uh, but the way I read this is that he's saying, oh, but it's good that I was also young once and maybe, or at least what I kind of connect with youth is maybe not being so responsible 
not working so hard, not putting your duty first. Uh, so he's saying that that was also kind of a, an important part of his life and he's very grateful uh, for having had that, but he doesn't really go into uh, why this is the case. Uh, and I guess the reason this spoke to me personally is because I've also had this kind of struggle with thinking on the one hand that I've kind of wasted my youth on uh, not really working hard or whatever, just do having fun, whatever. Uh, but then on the other hand, also thinking, but on the other hand, that was a good uh, thing to do. And I, I would be much more of a boring person if I just become an adult as a teenager already. Yeah, it's a really good message. Um, there's this quote a long time ago that stuck with me, and I don't know if it's stoic, but it's but the the principle is stoic, and it it it, meant, it, says, it went along the lines of be um, uh, don't be sad that something has ended, just be happy that it happened, um, uh, which I think is a very stoic principle. It's just um, which is. A, a bit non-traditional for Stoics. No Stoics are, I wouldn't say pessimistic, but they're definitely not pessimistic, but they're also not, um, uh, they don't like to say, feel happy about this. You know, they're not the ones to say that, but they are, but it does sound Stoic in the sense that um, you should be um, uh, thankful for what has happened in the past and not um, not sad that it ended. Um, and I think this is exactly what you're, you're discussing, Morton, is that um, he's very happy for how his youth ended up. Um, even myself, like I would, I, I thought about this for a while, and uh, I would agree that I think we've all had mistakes we may or have been made to us in our youth. But for me, I I wouldn't regret what had happened. I think it may be the person I am today. And also, I think this is a good. I think I like the fact that you picked this part of that last part of book one, because this leads nicely into book two, which is all about death and all about meditating on death and the present um, and how the present is um, uh, only momentary. Um, and it's the only part of life, part of time that you really do exist. He mentions this often, that you have to focus on the present. Um, and is that something you wrote down the last the last quote was that you, Morton? Oh, no, that was Shakam. Um, oh, okay. So this was, um, this is really from Leo Tolstoy. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good quote uh, anyway. Uh, and oh, the uh, oh, the majority quote. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Majority quote. Oh, did you find it? Because I, the closest one I could find is is uh, the one I just I just uh, pointed now. Yeah, I couldn't find it in the meditations. Uh, no, I think yeah. So I, I looked around and it's yeah. uh, totally. Uh, Okay, no, because I also thought it's not from uh, Marcus. But but if we look at chapter three, paragraph four. I think it says something very similar, right? Yeah, and I also found uh, Epictetus uh, quotes uh, with a very similar uh, idea, ideas. So uh, it's, it, you know, it, it might be a stoic uh, idea or, or thought, or thought that they had. It's just this particular quote is not uh, from Marcus Aurelius. But yeah, that's that's the internet. All right. Uh, Yannis, you had raised your hand. Is that is there something more you wanted to say, or you just wanted to mention this 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 quote? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, that's all from my side. Okay. Um, this is also I, I didn't know if this was necessarily from the meditations or not because i also didn't know which translation you were using maybe the word majority is translated differently it, it does sound a little bit stoic i know that um uh, there's a good paper by um on zeno's republic zeno the founder of stoicism and his republic his work that which is now lost and uh, it's by john sellers the philosopher today who specializes in stoicism and um he talked a little about the cynics 
who were like the fathers of Stoics. They, the Zeno um, and the other early Stoics founded their philosophy, at least in part based on cynicism in some principles. And the cynics um, uh, had that, um, were probably at the very end of the extreme of not listening to the majority. They were the ones to go out in the streets and um, uh, um, they, there are common examples of, of um, having sex in the streets and being naked in the streets and eating on the ground and things like that. And um, going up to, uh, they had famous cynics who, uh, the famous cynic Diogenes who would go, who would burst into a, an open lecture in the amphitheater and just start um, peddling or making fun of the person lecturing. Um, uh, I think it's good the Stoics didn't stick with the cynics, but to an extent, the cynics really do embody that principle of not caring about the majority, not caring about, um, I think there's an extent to which out of due diligence and responsibility, we need to connect with others. So we need to think about their, we need to consider their opinion as equal to ours. But in another sense, um, if you know you're doing something virtuous and good, or that's okay, then you shouldn't worry about what other people are thinking of you. And I think this is the path that Marcus Aurelius would want you to follow. This is a good passage, Giannis, that you, that you took. I just realized, did we lose Abdul? No? Okay. He said uh, he has to go. Oh. So sorry, I missed that. Okay. All right. Okay. You know, I think I, I think I misinterpreted it as a quote as I was just running through the chat. I was like, oh, it's another quote, and I kept going down. Okay. Okay. Um, Chetan. Uh, yeah. Um, this there is this quote by Morton that he just sent it. Uh, and I, I would just like to know what is he mean uh, the author of this by uh, those men who live in accordance with nature i mean uh, if you would know some other code like what does marcus aurelius mean by nature here if somebody would know uh yeah sure Tom, maybe you can give a good um, good response hey, no i'm i'm not in here you can you can go ahead uh... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just posted that quote because it was uh, to continue that um, that conversation and felt it uh, tacked nicely onto that. Uh, as I understand, when he says uh, men who live according with nature, uh, it's people who kind of uh, do do the duties you're supposed to do and use uh, reason and, and philosophy and stoic philosophy, um, especially um in, to kind of guide their their thoughts and actions and who kind of realize in this kind of pantheistic way that they're all part of the same kind of uh, universe and that all 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 humans and all reason come from the same place and are essentially connected and the same Thanks. yeah that's um that's that's a good interpretation of nature. We had a four part, actually three or four part series on on duty in the very very beginning as we were opening up this this where we were just beginning organizing this meetup uh, in August September last year. And um, it's interesting now you mentioned duty and its connection to nature um, because they definitely had maybe a sense of it. I think duty ethics is another kind of ethics entirely that started with. Um, that more started with Kant and around the time of enlightenment. But um, I think this idea of um, virtue and nature still connects with duty as something that you're responsible for adhering to or actually acting on. Um, nature uh, is a vague word. I don't think the academics really fully understand it. I think they've been fighting over what it really means. I think if for, for definitely one thing, nature is definitely not the nature we think of. It's not because they, they didn't have the industry in the, in the, in the cities we, ha we have today. So they weren't separated from nature. So they just lived in nature. I don't think that was on their minds necessarily all the time because it was all around them. I think nature though is generally um, 
attributed to logos, this idea that you follow the reason or of the universe. There is there is a metaphysics behind it. So while I say that the, the Stoics did have a strong metaphysical belief that there is this idea of fate or providence, um, I'm, I'm not convinced by that entirely. Um, I think the main principle behind nature, at, if you want to interpret it as a modern Stoic, if you don't want to believe the metaphysics behind it, is if there, it can, you can also take it stoically as, as when they say live according to nature, what they're really saying is accept what's coming to you. If it, if it comes to you, if it happens to you, um, you can't change what had already happened to you if it already happened. So accept it and then move on and then only only change what's in, within your control. So it, it still connects to this dichotomy of control that nature is something that is outside of your control that you should accept and you should live with and then everything else is inside of your control. Um, but they did have this huge metaphysical idea of it that I, I wouldn't, for me personally, I don't accept. Um, there are traditional Stoics. I don't know too much about them, but apparently there is a modern, um, a contemporary set of people today who do try and follow a traditional Stoic um, life. They believe in all the metaphysics and the gods and the um, universe burning up in fire at the end of the at the end of time and recycling itself. They believe in all this, but um, uh, but you can still interpret nature as this um, um, this. Um, uh, worldview that of, of accepting what happens to you. Um, Giannis and then Shaka. Um, no, actually, maybe I'm a little bit confused because uh, what Martin sent here is, I thought in the beginning it's another translation of the same one I sent, but maybe not. Maybe it's further down in 3.4, right? That's, that's just uh, my confusion. I'm trying to understand. Um, but in any case, um, because in, uh, in 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 what I uh, in in the in the uh, um, uh, part I sent, uh, what he points out is, uh, be careful not to lose uh, you know focus, um, and and what is the focus actually at the end is to observe um, our own ruling power. But this is um, a translation of the. Um, uh, I don't know how how you would translate hegemonico in in English or so our our inner um, um, yeah I don't know let's take this translation anyway to to observe our own ruling power so this is. Um, this is uh, also something uh, that we live to live according to your nature is to to uh, all observe um, and maintain uh, this state, internal state and mindfulness of of what um, uh, um, of how we per perceive the outside world and how we um, uh, maintain our. Um, um, inner state. But anyway, so um, we can pass to the, the talking to the next person. I think I'm just confused a little bit with the translations, that's all. Yeah, it's um, just, just as a word, but yeah, in response to what you're saying, yeah, I think the translations are can be very, very different if if they even if especially if they differ by 100 or 150 years, which some, some of the translations do like Christopher Gill's or my translation, these are 21st century translations. But if you take a translation from the 18th century or around or the 19th century or around there, it's going to be, I think it's going to be quite different, um, which is quite interesting. This is why I asked you to put the translation down just to make sure everybody knows it might be a different text. Um, Shakam. Yeah, so I think logos can be reason in my translation, I think it's um, the ruling faculty um, of of oneself and the universe. It's like the logic or the reason that moves all things. Um, 
they didn't um, and yeah that's like really has like really strong uh, ties and origins uh, from their um their uh, metaphysics um they didn't believe in uh, the atoms and such uh, like the epicureans they thought uh, that there is um this force which can can be fate can sometimes say uh, it's called nature sometimes universe it's not really yeah like well defined um scientifically but for me i, I don't believe in any metaphysical being that uh, pushes uh, events uh, like intentionally um fate is just uh, this very complex uh, system that we don't know uh, like all the components and where they are exactly so i think maybe with perfect knowledge there will be no no fate no chance but yeah then you get quantum uh, mechanics and then yeah, who knows? <laughs> but yeah, so anyway, for me, Logos is the logic that uh, drives uh, the universe, but also your own decisions. And to act according to this uh, reason um, is, is, yeah, like, also one of the most central uh, ideas or principles of stoicism. Um, there is a, uh, there are three uh, stoic um, disciplines, I guess you would call them, um, that uh, help um, that we extract just like with the virtues from the stoic philosophy, um, actually but the Stoic virtues, I know that Marcus Aurelius mentions explicitly in book three or four, where he literally just lists them out. I don't think they do this with the Stoic disciplines. And the Stoics also have, at least modern scholars interpret the Stoics as having these three disciplines. One of them is action, um, which is not necessarily usually associated with Stoicism. Stoicism is considered passive a lot of the time, where some people who don't, people who try to think indifferently, feel indifferently and act differently. Um, but the, the Stoics really, really, um, cared about acting in accordance with your own vir virtues and values. Um, but one thing they, one thing, and this is why I think this is connected with this, one, one thing they really, really focused on, they really emphasized is that you know, when you act, you act in accordance with nature. And what they meant was, I think in that respect, this is the second interpretation Mr. Khan is talking about. Acting in, acting in your accord, acting in accord with your own nature means acting in accord with your own reason, with your own logic. This is this comes back to the original idea of rationality that um, uh, um, so I think they had to, a twofold interpretation of nature, um, which maybe for them they didn't distinguish too much, at least spiritually. But for us, I think you could inter you could separate the universal um, logos of the universe of of this um, natural um, or, or divine world of reason driving everything versus the internal world of yourself your mind, your ruling faculties, use your reason um, before you act. And this is just in line with what he's talking about. Um, and also what Giannis was saying before, that there's this internal component too, that they're not saying necessarily direct yourself um, towards the, the reason or logic of the universe. They said direct yourself inward, first focus yourself inward. Um, I think it was Giannis who mentioned this inward uh, turn um, uh, and then act. Um, I, I would like to point to nine, nine, chapter 9, paragraph 28, where it exactly analyzes, um, in the, I think, one of the best parts of the book, analyzes the, uh, well, basically it says it doesn't really matter if things are happening by accident or, um, or anyway, uh, randomly, or because someone is behind um, controlling them, uh, like the fates or, or whatever. 
Well, at the end, it doesn't make a lot of difference. And he makes a very uh, logical analysis why it doesn't make a difference. Because at the end, it reaches the conclusion. At the end, it's something that's outside our control anyway, whether it happens accidentally or by, um, by chance or someone else is controlling it. As long as it's something out of your control, it, it doesn't matter, right? It's a really nice point to make. Yeah, it's it also um, he mentioned this often. I think um, just before just before I turn it over to Morton, Marcus Aurelius mentions this often that he he believes in the gods, but he often says, "But if the gods don't exist," and then he continues. And he often says that, where he says it doesn't really matter if the gods exist or not. What matters is that you live according to your virtues, you're living according to nature, um, which I think is pretty inclusive of the philosophy, to not really care about your metaphysics in the end. I think it's good that he's um, like a, a nice bookmark to the Stoic tradition. Marcus, after Marcus Aurelius, the Stoic school pretty much died out. Um, but he's a nice bookmark or footnote to the philosophy because he he finally inserted that kind of inclusivity in the philosophy that it doesn't really matter what metaphysically you believe. What matters is that you do this, you uphold your character in accordance with these virtues. And this is a nice, um, uh, something nice, nicely psychological he puts in puts into the philosophy that you should um, uh, care more about how you uphold yourself rather than what you believe spiritually. Um, what yeah, about the the existence of of God and how he mentions that often. Actually, I found those reasonings to be among the weakest in the book, uh, where he kind of just has this belief uh, in the gods, but he doesn't really ever explain it. He just takes it for granted. Uh, but I think this is quite common with, let's say, pre Enlightenment philosophers or so. It's like a big weak spot for all of them that they just view the world through this prism of God existing. Um, but um, yeah, what I actually wanted to, to go back to is to what you, you Steve said earlier about the, how it's a big stoic principle to, to act in according, uh, accordance with your principles. And this is what I found to be one of the biggest question marks in the book, because I found it to be a bit hypocritical, uh, because he's writing so much about this kind of uh, brotherhood with with all humans how we're all kind of of the same um, divine spirit or he kind of phrases it in a bit different ways uh, but what he's actually doing with his time while he's writing this is he's engaging in this kind of in a historical sense pointless wars where he's brutal, brutally massacring um, a lot of these basically savages or whatever foreign enemies as well as leading his own Roman Roman men to uh, to death for no reason, and there seems to be very little, if any, reflection on all of this. So does he just see it as his duty to be emperor and to to lead these men then and to death and to to kill men? Um, and if so, why? Because he is the emperor, so he has the power to choose if they go to war, as I see it. So I'm kind of a bit wondering: is is this whole meditations just kind of a way to take his mind off this kind of grim reality and to kind of defend to himself that he is actually not this man who is leading on the battlefield but he is this noble philosopher who sees everybody as his equal as his brother when the reality is actually very different you make a good point um he often does this. I mean, he persecuted Christians, um, like every good uh, um, Roman emperor back then. Um, he, he definitely put a lot of people to death, as most emperors do for the Roman for the Roman Empire. Um, so it's it. I, yeah, um, I think he definitely tried to look inward. I would definitely agree that this was when he was writing in his journal privately. This is a nice preview from all the empirical duties he had to execute um, that he, I'm not sure uh, the argument that you're making that he tried to convince himself that he's a good person when he's doing all these things. Um, I think he would have acknowledged that he's not a good person. Um, I think as much as he, you're right, he's hypocritical and in like you, you cannot, you cannot 
a, like agree, agree with stoicism like this book and also like Marcus Aurelius. I think Marcus Aurelius is a personal figure and emperor is nobody necessarily to look up to in all regards, like any powerful figure. Um, but um, I'm not sure, I, I, th I, this is only a speculation. I'd like to think that he would consider himself not a perfect person. And I think he would have liked to comment on his um, workings as an emperor, but he doesn't even list the good things he did in an emperor. He doesn't list anything he does in an emperor um, in his meditations. So to be honest, I'm not sure what he thinks of himself, but it does make sense that he would treat this as kind of like um, a good barrier to what he's doing on the outside of his tent. Like he, he, does, he fights on his tent, he, he fights against these German barbarians in the North, then he goes into his tent and writes in his journal. It might be like a therapeutic kind of thing. Um, which is another, which is a, something else stoic that we can talk about later. But um, journaling is as, as, as something, as sorry, something therapeutic for us. Um, but uh, yeah, you do make a good point. He's nothing. He's nobody to be admired as a person or looked up to as an idol. Um, his philosophy, though, is what lasts with us. Um, Yanis. Actually, I'm not sure where in the text it says, um, "Do good to your fellow men." Um, I think what he says in many parts of the book, and I think it's one of the main points of the book, is to benefit the society. I don't think it takes it, you know, uh, specifically, specifically to, to individual level, but everywhere I can read, it says, do whatever you can to benefit the society. This is the goal of, or the meaning of life according to Stoics, basically. So your question, I like your question. Actually, I didn't think about it but I, uh, before, but I think I can imagine he was looking at it as, a, as his duty to protect his, uh, to protect his society, to protect his country. Because, I mean, he says in many, in many parts of the book, like uh, the, the, um, about the whole, the whole is many levels, like your, your village, your city, your country. And you're, you are part of your country. You have to benefit um, to, to, to benefit your country your, and protect it. And it's your duty. So, and at the end, if you want to see it uh, from the war perspective, I mean, if he wouldn't go to war, then the, the enemy would, would come in and kill uh, so many other people, right? I mean, you can also see it like this. I mean, it, at the end, <laughs> not that I would... <laughs> advocate for war, uh, but uh, at the end, you, you can also see it as protecting other people by killing other people. I mean, a war, I mean, in the third century, <laughs> um, whoever doesn't eat the other, he is eaten. I don't know, um, but yeah. Okay. Um, I saw uh, Shakam and then Chetan. Um, so, let's go first. Uh, anyway, uh, I want to say uh, shortly uh, that he writes to himself uh, it was the end of uh, book nine. Say to the ruling uh, faculty, Art thou dead? Art thou corrupted? Art thou, art thou playing the hypocrite? Art thou becoming a beast? Dost thou, thou herd and feed with the rest? We lost Morton, um, which is a shame because I just wanted uh, to say that um, I don't think uh, Marcus uh, loved uh, being uh, in the front line in the in, in the in the camp uh, waging war. Um, I think he would have liked to spend his time. Listening uh, to philosophy lectures. Oh. oh, welcome back. So, yeah, again, I don't think Marcus would would have loved uh, the war, and I think he did see it uh, as uh, his duty uh, to the Roman people, as an emperor, and um, he also. Uh, was a very um, very good uh, diplomat 
and when when he could i like to think uh, that um that he took uh, the peaceful uh, route because he says that men are people uh, are made uh, for cooperation and but in reality you can't cooperate with everybody some some of them uh, are corrupted and violent and they they wouldn't let you get the the, the peaceful option so i like to think and of course we we can't we can't know without uh, asking uh, him in person uh, i think if he when he had the choice he took a uh, or tried to take the better uh, the better option yeah uh, i just occurred to me that first with accordance with nature i asked that question because um there is i have i have practiced and learned and read something like that in the eastern philosophies as well it says be in accordance with nature in your life and what what i understood what or i was could understand from there was the inner nature which Yanis uh, also mentioned, and I think that inner nature was calmness, which is a natural, natural state of all of us beneath our mental chatter, uh, deep within us, that ruling faculty. I think it's calmness, and from where and from that calmness, I think this virtuous active actions uh, come out. Uh, no. No person in his sane mind would do crazy stuff. I think that could also be one interpretation of this nature that he's mentioning. Uh, but of course, it's my perspective. Uh, and regarding this, I, I didn't know Marcus Aurelius went to war. <laughs> but do we know that there, there was a was there a reason for him to go to war or or it was not a reason because even in in eastern there's a very big text in in from india which is a very big war which was in 5000 bc i think and it was called mahabharat and it was it was a crazy war uh, killing 18 lasted 18 days and killed many people but there was a reason behind it so i mean I'm just curious to know but otherwise we can't know the history so that's fine um uh oh, oh, maybe maybe quickly respond to the question um yeah there uh, he, he went to war because um actually you could still find uh ruins of these um uh roman strongholds in um germany um chechia um uh austria um that um the romans put up small barriers uh literally walls um and put um they they fortified the walls with soldiers and stations in order to keep out the germans in the north um and then it is pretty much well known today that after marcus aurelius even while he was emperor but especially after he was emperor um the roman empire started declining because the germans started actually getting through those barriers and the romans just couldn't keep the empire together so the if, if i don't know what you mean by a good reason so like it's there was a reason why he went to war but i you know it's up for debate whether any war is a good reason um but yeah the reason was that um they kept um seeing invasions in the north and he needed to go to the north to fight them off there was also um there's also um and i'm not too sure about this but i i believe there's also fighting to the east um as well um uh because of the rise of the ottomans as well the ottomans were starting to rise after marcus aurelius so um there there were several different reasons um why the romans had to um uh 
had to be prepared and had to go to war. Um, he was writing on the front lines, actually. He was writing a part of the meditations while he was at war. In fact, I, th I think that's why they, they, they think he started writing the meditations while he was at war. This is like when he, he started writing this in his old age, like around that time that was, you know, he was in his late 40s, early 50s when he started writing this, and it was while he was off in battle. So, um, Morton, you had a question, you raised your hand, I saw. Uh, sorry, I was just going to answer the, the war question. Nothing else. <laughs> okay. Um, something else I wanted, uh, just a fleeting thought, I guess we're all um, contemplating whether or, not, whether or not Marcus Aurelius was genuine um, about the, um, uh, about his meditations, about what he's saying, about his philosophy, if he's upholding that as a, as his, in his own character. Um, I kind of, I kind of do agree in part that maybe um, philosophically he had ideas about a broader cosmopolitanism, a broader understanding of human um, camaraderie. But in the end, um, he and I don't. I, this is also for scholars to know, for especially political, political scholars to know that uh, he was the emperor, and as an empire, or uh, like even in modern, even in recent times, as a colonial empire, um, the whole reason for being a colonial empire. Um, aside from resources, is as they, they put this under the guise of we want to spread our virtues around the world um, and call you our fellow citizens. Um, I'm just speculating that that may be a reason why the Roman Empire grew so big. It wasn't like conquest is kind of the end result, but their end, but, but perhaps he might have justified to himself that. Um, uh, that obviously um, those within the empire are his own kin or brothers, but outside the empire becomes a different story. Um, just a fleeting thought. Um, that empire might have also had something to do with it. I don't think out of context, I don't think you can ever separate him out of context. I don't think there's anybody in the world you can separate out of context. Although his philosophy is, is, quite, is quite nicely framed and something you can apply I think more justly and ethically. Um, speaking of which, I do wanted to mention just before we move on, uh, if you're interested, Shatan, um, a big story theme is tranquility, is peace of mind. Actually, there's a Greek word called arete, um, and I don't, I forget where the accent is. So <laughs> this is the, these are the English letters, but there's an accent, I think, on the last e, um, uh, and um, it, this is the Greek word for tranquility. In fact, the whole reason for following the virtues is to attain tranquility. So this is actually in the opposite of the Epicureans. The Epicureans and Stoics thought, thought about this, academically speaking. They, um, the Stoics thought that you should first follow the virtues. That's your goal. And a byproduct of that is having a more tranquil mind to interstate. The Epicureans thought the reverse. They thought that in order to uh, the best way to follow your virtues is to be more tranquil. They, they kind of thought that, they, they kind of put virtues as a secondary goal underneath tranquility, and the Stoics thought the opposite. This is a big thing in the Hellenistic, um, in the Hellenistic schools back then between them. Um, this is how I think the rivalry we started was their fundamental difference in placing tranquility above, or happiness above one above the other. Um, but the Stoics thought exactly this, that virtues lead to tranquility. Um, Shakam and then Melis. Yeah, um, just want to say, uh, I don't think Marcus Rose thought about himself as a sage, as someone who's already wise um, in in philosophy and uh, in the ways of uh, the Stoics. Um, he thought uh, about <laughs> other Stoics uh, as uh, his role models. Um, and I think uh, uh, maybe he'll find it uh, a bit uh, amusing that we are regarding him as a as a wise man, as a sage. Um, he never intended uh, his personal journal to be read almost uh, 2,000 years later. Um, we are doing him a, a disservice by 
peering into uh, his journal. <laughs> um, no, I think I think it's great that, that uh, we ha we have uh, records uh, of the inner thoughts of a man that uh, lived so long ago. Um, anyway, he also um, he sacrificed uh, Christians uh, to the lions uh, in order to combat uh, the Antonine plague. Um, so, I don't know, maybe he was uh, wise after all. Nellis. Uh, sorry, I'm not an uh, expert in this topic, but uh, from my point of view, we are talking about the non-controllable -contro factors, uh, external factors. And being an emperor and uh, find yourself in the middle of the war and obliged to kill some people is an external factor. And uh, being correct, being uh, ethically right, being political correctness is very egocentric approach of our century. If we will go back to that part, uh, not part, that uh, years, this kind of things could be easily considered as external factors, which Stoism say it could happen and you should, but you must do. Uh, this is my approach about this topic, but just uh, what I, I understand from this discussion, my point of view. Yanis. Yeah, sorry, again, I have, I think I have to emphasize again the sense of duty that Marcus has and points out in several parts in the book that everybody, as part of the society, as part of the whole, again, um, as, as a particle of, of the universe, or, um, well, not the universe, um, the, 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 the human society, is assigned a specific role and it's a specific duty. And it's his duty to, to accomplish this as the best way possible. And his, his role was to be an emperor. He didn't choose it. I don't think he was a, his ambition ever to be an emperor. It just happened that it was like this. And he accomplished his duty and his role in the best possible way. So I don't see how this is hypocritical again. I, I am, I'm still struggling with them with this uh, <laughs> characterization. So yeah, I think I think we're all falling in line with this. I think I think and I think this is a good point at which we can move away from this character. I think there's no point in discussing further um, uh, speculating about his character. Um, but I think especially you're right, we're, we're pretty much on the consensus that his, his um, no, I just don't is, see the contradiction so yet. I mean, I haven't seen the contradiction yet. This is what I'm trying to say. So if to, from my side, everything is quite consistent, what I read in this book. Yeah, um, yeah. OK, that's all I wanted to say. Fine. Um, I actually wanted to um, uh, move on to a, a different topic. Um, there was a section in book two. So I'm kind of trying to pick out quotes um, to speak about, and this kind of gives me more room for next next week as well. Um, if you guys join again, we can continue throughout the book, um, and there might be others attending. But there's something in book two I wanted to mention, because book two was a nice follow-up from book one, and book two was really a, a good focus on um, death and the present, and there was a um, section in which really, um, I think this is a really, really nice paragraph that um, uh, There it is. Um, book two, chapter 14. So book two, 14, and this is the, um, if you look in the chat, the uh, Martin Hammond 2006 edition. So book two, chapter 14. Um, Even if you were destined to live 3,000 years, and this is, this is this translation that I'm reading. Even if you were destined to live 3,000 years or 10 times that long, nevertheless, remember that no one loses any life other than the one he lives or lives any life other than the one he loses. It follows that the longest and the shortest lives are brought to the same state. 
The present moment is equal for all, so what is passing is equal also. The loss, therefore, turns out to be the merest fragment of time. No one can lose either the past or the future. How could anyone be deprived of what he does not possess? And I thought that was fantastic. That was, I think, the best quote in this book. Like, not the, not the book, but book two. Um, uh, because that, I think that summarized and generalized what he was discussing in book two um, in terms of uh, his meditations on... Uh, he meditates more on death, but this was a good opening to meditating on death. He never mentions death explicitly, but he mentions this idea that... Um, uh, that it, I think more metaphysically, I think psychologically, in order to train yourself, focus on the present um, because the past and the future you can't control. But I think metaphysically, he's, something very, he's, saying, he's saying something very powerful. He's saying that the past and future almost don't exist almost to an extent, or if they do exist, and I, I don't think he really, really care. I think he, he does the same thing here he does with the gods, that if they do exist, they don't matter because they're outside of your control. They're either done already or they're they're not even, they haven't even come yet. Um, and I think um, this really helps, like meditating on this quote for me is perfect because if there's any point at which I am uh, too long ruminating on something that has happened in the past, like I'm pretty much anxious about what happened or I'm anxious about something to come, um, it, this is a good quote to kind of bring me back literally to the present and just say, just do what you're focusing on and don't worry about what's behind you or forward of you. Um, Uh, Shaka Khan, you said, since it is possible that thou mayest depart from life this very moment, regulate every act and thought accordingly. Yeah. Yeah, this is also a good one. Um, this is this entire book, too. It's just one memento mori. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so um, memento mori, for those who um, don't know the phrase or... Um, don't know enough about it, but this is a very stoic practice. Um, it um, literally is not just a remembrance of death, it is a meditation on death. It is a meditation on the ephemeral or temporary nature of life. And what's more powerful about the passage I was reading in, in book two, chapter 14, I, he, he also made very explicit that there's really no difference between those who live long and those who live short, because the only the only thing that's shared similarly between you is the fact that you live here and now, um, and then that's it. You both experience the here and now. Um, yeah, it, yeah. it also, I completely agree with you. It's, it's a fascinating text. Um, it also connects a little bit <clears throat> with the uh, technique, the, the stoic technique of decomposing uh, to smaller parts. So, you know, if you see life, uh, um, the past and the future and all this is uh, uh, sometimes uh, um, harder to manage. Uh, memories, feelings uh, for the, from the past, for fears for the future. But if you cut everything and you cut now in this particular case the, the time and you, you focus on, on the present, um, it's, uh, um, it's easier. Yeah. So... It, it's it's another dimension, I think, of this of this um, of this text. Okay. I was just waiting to see if anybody else would would follow, but um, no, thank you. Um, uh, that decomposition. Ah, uh, this is what Shakam had found. Um, Shakam, could you also put the um the thanks <laughs> book four? Um, I'm not sure. I'm trying to think if I, I'm not sure if Marcus Aurelius had um, uh, took took it upon himself to meditate on this decomposition of nature, but I'm pretty sure that he's not the first one. Um, I'm just not sure if he's the first Stoic. Um, that's what I mean to say. I know he's not the first Greek philosopher to think about this decomposition of time and space in two parts to handle them, but I'm not sure if this is the, he was the first Stoic to put this into a practical element to it. Yeah, exactly. So, so. But this is a really useful tool. Um, 
uh, this is really useful. Also a good time to kind of maybe move more into a practical discussion that um, to meditate on death and to meditate on the present is not just a meditation. It's not just to kind of experience the present. It's also to focus on being productive in the present. Um, you need to accomplish something. You need to direct your rational mind to finish some sort of task or accomplish something. Um, then obviously, um, focus on the present and de decompose them into different parts. This is actually a good discussion. Um, I think, Shaham, you were here, and Gonzalo, who's not here, was here this time. There was a, um, maybe one or two months ago, we were having a meeting and um, we got into this very different discussion, but interestingly, a related discussion on how um, uh, they were, I think all two or three of you, Shaham, were software engineers um, uh, or software developers and you, uh, we're discussing different um, different work habits or different productivity methods. And you you brought up this fact, you brought up this idea of, of um, cutting this up into small little tasks um, because there was a question I think Ava posed um, who had been on here at that time. And she asked the question, but um, what's the general idea? Like, what is your general target? What do you really want to accomplish, your full story? And the general consensus was that maybe while you do have a full picture of what you want to accomplish, the idea is not to focus on that. The idea is to focus only on the smaller elements and steps that take you to that end. Um, and this is a really nice connection to stoicism. I think that's a good, con um, maybe um, somebody can speak to uh, more work productivity um, from a work productivity perspective about that. Um, but this is um, this is exactly in line with stoicism. Yeah, yeah so Steve, ahead. I found, I, I think, I think, I think I found it. I think you, you're saying the same thing. Um, sorry, what, what number is the letter eta? Uh, eight. So eight, um, in 836, um, oops. I'm pressing buttons in my laptop in the wrong way. Um, in 8:36, it says, uh, "Don't, don't, don't be confused about the image of the of of." Uh, I don't know if you can find an English translation. Maybe it helps better because I have a Greek one in front of me. Uh, but don't don't get confused about looking on the whole the whole uh, picture of life because it's it's too complex. So uh, bre better break it down. Um, uh, into a smaller parts. So this is uh, now I found what I was trying to say in earlier. I think also that the um, decomposition into parts, what it means. I think he explains it here. Yeah, yeah, I see it. Um, actually, it's interesting. So in in, in my translation in thirty six, he only mentions about. I think the opening line says that he says, "Do not let the panorama of your life oppress you." Just a fancy way of saying, um, don't let the whole story or objective of your life interfere with anything you're doing right now. Yeah. In 35, so in the passage right before it, that's where he talks about the decomposition. He says just exactly what you're saying. Um, uh, uh, in the same way that nature turns its own purpose, anything obstructive or contrary, placing it in the faded scheme of things and making it a part of itself. So the rational being can also convert every obstacle into material for his own use and use it to further whatever his original purpose was. Um, and the reason I, I mentioned this, I think this is a good connection because what he's saying is just whatever your original purpose is, whatever your overarching purpose is, um, it's something that you need to just put aside for a moment and focus on those um, smaller obstacles in your way. Um, because, uh, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you won't ever get over them. Exactly. Are you reading in Greek, Yanis? Are you reading the book in Greek? Uh, uh, I, I, I'm, read, I'm reading a Greek translation. It's easier for me because in the, my English is not so good. But uh, oh, okay. but I still cannot. I cannot read the original. Unfortunately, it's it's quite hard. To, for me to, to understand ancient Greek. Well, I, I'm also wondering if, if you know, if there's, um, I mean, I, I know that there's a difference between the ancient and modern Greek, but as far as the translation goes, is the translation from ancient to modern Greek easier than let's say ancient to Greek to the English or, or German? 
Yeah, I can imagine, yeah. I mean, I can imagine, yes. But I'm not an yeah. expert to answer. No. But it's interesting because perhaps the translation you're reading is perhaps closer to what he's trying to say. Than, yeah, I can see. Yeah. I can see the the correspondence easier. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, just a last call out. Does anybody else? Would anybody else like to mention anything else from the meditations that he or she would have, uh, would have liked to recommend or give as advice to yourself um, in order to improve yourself or improve yourself? Um, and just as a transition into that, because if, if, if nobody does um, respond to it, maybe we can slowly start to end and the meetup. But just as a nice um, culmination to this meetup um, and for anybody who, had, who is just dipping their feet in stoicism or just came upon the meditations, um, uh, that this meditations is a example, is an example of a, um, a stoic practice of journaling and negative visualization. Um, this is really the, um, one of the main um, resources for wondering what the stoics do to be stoic. Um, and that is it. Um, so what, the Stoics like to do is they like to practice by journaling, but it's more than that. When they journal, um, and he does this often, when they when you journal, um, you are supposed to negatively visualize. Um, for example, um, this is a very popular common tactic. In fact, he does this in book two. Um, uh, negatively visualize what is ahead of you in order to better prepare for it. But really the whole book is a meditation on it. The whole book is a meditation on how to prepare for what is ahead of you, the obstacles ahead of you. And this is book two. This is the opening line of book two. Um, say to yourself first thing in the morning, today I shall meet people who are meddling, ungrateful, aggressive, treacherous, malicious, unsocial. And that's an example. But he does this often where he knows he has a task ahead of himself um, or he had a task before and he meditates on how to accomplish or how to best prepare for it in the worst of circumstances. Um, it is there. I, I, I also don't discount because I try to be a bit more eclectic. So I don't discredit the po positive visualization that you can use in some respects. But a big stoic contribution to psychology is negative visualization. This removing your false expectations of what may come ahead of you. Um, the idea is not to have negative expectations, right? The idea is not to have... Um, uh, not to be pessimistic, basically, so that, you know, if something good happens to you, you feel great. But um, I think the Stoics would have had a problem with that as well. Um, the whole point of this is not to have any expectations. It's just, just understand that the worst can happen to you. And if the worst can happen to you, and the worst does happen to you, then there's nothing to worry about. It's not about trying to be happy on the other side of it. It's trying to just prepare for the worst so that if the worst does happen to you, then you you know you're safe, you know you've prepared for it, you know you can deal with it, and you know, you know you're gonna get past it in the end. Um, so if you're interested in taking any large practice from this, not just the small decomposition of elements or dichotomy of control, um, a, a, the big takeaway is and a good recommendation for Stoics. This is not for every Stoic, but I really like to do this every day or at most, um, or at least every two days. Uh, I really try and meditate in a journal. Um, this is my idea of a meditation is to just journal to myself. Um, every morning or every evening, um, negatively, negatively visualize or uh, try to deal with my expectations for the day ahead. I also like to meditate on anything going on in my life um, uh, and really psychoanalyze it. Um, and I also, in the end, reflect on what has come before um, and understand what I can do better. Um, the fear is that Gonzalo had mentioned this um, when we continue bringing up journaling. The idea is not to ruminate. So in psychology, um, from the little that I've, I've done in my research um, is that they really, um, especially psychologists who study stoic practices of journaling, um, they don't like you to ruminate. When they say ruminate, don't meditate to
too long or much on these negative visualizations. Um, don't focus on them as your entire existence because that's also really, really detrimental to your psychological health. The idea is just to understand, like just to help you feel comfortable and understand that this is the real world and anything can happen. So, um, okay, so we're pretty much reaching the two hour mark and I do have a last few remarks before we end, just to wrap up. Um, if you're interested, um, part two of the meditations and Marcus Aurelius discussion is next Saturday. Um, the week after that, I'll be taking a hiatus. I will not be organizing a meetup the week after that, um, just because I need a break. And um, I am uh, teaching full time. The next few weeks are my kids' exams. Um, I really don't have the time. I really am in every day reviewing with them. And I'm also in charge of monitoring the exams. So I really just need to take the week after that off just to kind of give myself a, some space. Um, uh, after that, so I believe that's now May. Um, we might be doing a Stoic meetup on Stoicism and Cynicism, or if there's another topic anybody would like to contribute or um, uh, propose or suggest we could do, then that would also be useful. Um, we have no definitive chronology of what topics to discuss or what to do during our meetups. We do this on a case-by-case -case basis. So you won't see an event come online no more than a week this was a special time where I really didn't understand that we would do a Marcus Aurelius two-part meetup. So, but usually this doesn't happen. Um, I do have a last couple of questions. Um, uh, um, first of all, if you do want to um, be more involved or hear more about the Berlin Stoics, um, you could join our Telegram group. Um, so if you're interested, please chat me on meetup. Um, and send me your number and I can add you to a Telegram group. Um, my last question is, do you have any feedback for me? Um, how did you enjoy this meetup? Um, do you have any criticism of me? Um, I've done my negative visualization for the day, so you can tell me anything and I'll be open about it. Um, so um, I'm not really worried. And it's also fodder for me to improve. So really, um, how did you like it? Well, does, I really like the uh, fact that it's organized regularly and uh, that you're very, um, well, hard looking for new topics and it's, it's not really fitting my uh, my immediate goals right now, which might mean that I will not attending the next couple of times because I'm really, well, more focused on the practical side of improving myself. And, I really don't have, I think I don't really want to read more uh, uh, literature in, in, in the near future. So I, I can't really, well, contribute much, to be honest. But I appreciate that, uh, that it's done, that it's organized so well. No, thank you. Um, oh, Melis. So I thank a lot because uh, I came here with no expectation. As I said, I just come uh, and it uh, was beyond my expectation. I had fun. It was great to listen to you and uh, motivated a lot to hear more. Uh, both passages are, uh, were great and also uh, the discussions, uh, your approach of, of deep diving to the passage were also great. Thank you for everyone. Thank you. Um, and thank you to everybody. So, um, oh, Yanis and the Chatan. Uh, Yanis. No, I just wanted to say that I also had fun. I think at the end, that's the important thing. I really enjoyed it. So thanks a lot. I think it was really uh, also uh, I exceeded my expectations as I am the first time here. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to the next one already. And Shatan? Yeah, uh, I would also like to say say the same as Yanis and Melis. I think uh, I needed, uh, it's a 
very nice reinforcing uh, things for me, which I have learned through a different bent of uh, literature. And uh, I, I really like some consistencies that were there in, in the things that we, we studied and uh, talked about today. And uh, I think they are really applicable and, and practical. So I really enjoyed the texts and passages. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you guys um, for coming. Um, I do just have kind of a, an advertisement. Um, if you're interested in getting more involved with Urban Stoics, we are looking for more help. Um, I'm looking for more help. Um, particularly, I'm looking for perhaps another organizer to help organize parallel meetups on the weekdays, because I know some people are more prefer something on the evening during the weekdays. I'm not available on the weekdays to do anything. Um, I'm also looking for uh, a um, more fluent German speaker to uh, host Berlin Stoics meetups. Um, on a weekly or, or bi-weekly basis. Um, so if you're interested to participate more with the Berlin Stoics and then also volunteer, um, please send me a message on Meetup um, or on the Berlin Stoics website um, if you did find us down, uh, uh, down on the website. Um, that's it. So uh, if I do see you next week, I really look forward to it. And if not, um, I really wish you the best of luck in your, in your stoic or philosophical journey. So thank you, everybody, for attending. Thanks, guys.